Hello folks, welcome back. Third week of September, and as you can see, goldenrod is in full bloom. Uh, it pretty much came into mid-bloom just a few days ago here in southern Ohio. Um, I'm in south central Ohio, uh, northern Adams County, so I'm about 30 minutes north of the Ohio River. Uh, asters are just starting to crack open. Um, pretty much the uh, we're at the tail end of the ironweed, so we've, we've got a pretty good flow going on. Tremendous amount of pollen coming in from several sources, but as you can see, a tremendous amount from the goldenrod. Uh, we also have wing stem blooming along with the, the asters in the tail end of the ironweed. So you get a variety of pollens coming in right now. Um, I've had a lot of notes and comments asking about various things from earlier this year. So I thought I would make a video just to kind of catch up. So I'm going to touch on several topics uh, from earlier this year and review what worked and maybe what didn't. So stick around. Okay, one of the uh, videos I made last March, uh, coming out of winter, I had a nuke that had a lot of dysentery and there was a, a lot of concern. So if you remember that video, which I'll leave a link up here in the corner, uh, that video I went through and inspected it really good, uh, made sure there was no brood diseases. I actually took a sample of bees, made sure they did not have nozema. The, hell, the, the hive was healthy, the nuke was healthy. It suffered from a lack of incoming fresh resources. And going through winter with a lot of the fall honeys and nectars, those have a lot of minerals and roughage in them as such. Um, if the bees can't get out on cleansing flights on a regular basis, it does create a, a dysentery problem. So it came down to, uh, the, it was warm enough in the spring that they could get out, um, but we were having a lot of fluctuations in temperatures. I really thought at that point, I done ruled out everything, they needed fresh resources. So what I ended up doing was one, I put a feeder on that nuke, and two, I actually swapped its location with a much, much stronger overwintered nuke. By doing that, the field bees from the location of the strong nuke suddenly was coming into this weaker nuke, bringing a tremendous amount of resources. There was absolutely no fighting. They're concentrated on bringing in fresh resources to boost that hive, whichever hive it is, to get it going for spring. They're in the process of trying to get that overwintered nest turned over to get young bees. I was absolutely amazed within two weeks, there was a tremendous amount of fresh nectar pollen. The queen had tremendously expanded her nest. Uh, we started getting uh, some of the ones that she already had were all hatching out. Uh, it really built up extremely fast. Uh, ended up moving them into a full-size production hive later that spring. They did really well. I uh, even took some uh, daughters off of her and moved, her, moved those daughters into some of the other hives. So that was one of them. And as you can see, I overwinter a lot of nukes. We're going into winter here pretty soon. Uh, I think I've got about a dozen nukes. They'll all go through winter as a five over five or a four over four. I find that the nukes do really well because they're no more than a few frames away from their food stores, either sideways or up. Unlike a 10 frame box, I have seen, if you didn't have in a 10 frame box a big, big population, if you have a smaller cluster and they tend to move off to the one side, I have seen them isolation starve where there would be three or even four frames of honey to the far side of the box. But if they're tucked over in that far side, which tends to be maybe the sunny side of the box, which is warmer, they tend to cluster up over there. If you have a really, really long cold spell, they can't move the cluster over to get to the food. So, you know, these five frame nukes, they're not near as big and strong as a 10 frame box going through winter, uh, but they're never very far from the honey or food stores. They build up just as fast in the spring. 
It also, you're overwintering a queen, a proven queen that you can move directly into, say, a hive that lost the queen over winter. Uh, so you have a lot of resources there to work with. So, yeah, uh, probably half of my bees are going through five over fives. I got a lot of young summer 2021 queens going into winter in five over five or four over four nukes. They do great. So keep that in mind. It's a way of bringing a, a young queen into the next spring just in case you need it in one of your big hives. So, but yeah, that one did fine. Came, came through, blew up, produced a really good honey crop once I moved her into a full-size hive. Now, one of the videos I got a tremendous amount of feedback on, whether it was uh, emails or comments, um, was the Demare method to prevent swarming. I want to point out real quick the wax moth over here. This time of year when it's getting cold, the wax moth populations kind of build up over the summer. They're looking for opportunities to sneak in these hives. A good strong hive will keep them under control. It's a cool day today, not a lot of activity. This is a really strong hive though. Uh, you'll recognize this box. Uh, I actually had it stacked a little higher earlier this year. This was the first one of the several that I tried the Demare on. If you remember, I left the queen, a little bit of brood, a few drawn frames, and a bunch of brand new waxed foundation frames in the bottom box. Took a deep with the majority of all the brood and nurse bees, moved them up on top above a queen excluder, an entrance, some boxes, another queen excluder. So I was able to separate them. The idea is you're mimicking a swarm. Suddenly you have no nurse bees, basically no brood. Uh, you've just got a field force and an older queen. So what did this hive do? 18 days later, this hive had built up so fast, even the drawn the undrawn waxed foundation frames I put in there, they had completely drawn those frames out. She had laid up eight frames with eggs and brood. 18 days later, they still swarmed. So I really didn't delay it by much, but benefit there. When she swarmed, she really didn't take a very big population because the box I had on top still had all the nurse bees, a tremendous amount of emerging bees in the top box. I still had a tremendous population up high that was going in and out a rear, a rear entry. So yeah, it still swarmed. It didn't swarm with a whole lot of bees. I ended up raising a queen in the top box at the same time. If you remember, I dropped the queen cell in there. So I was able to kind of just move her on down. Uh, they still produced a tremendous honey crop this year but I was a little disappointed that how fast she blew up and still swarmed on me. So that was one example. Uh, another example is in the solid green hive back over my shoulder here. Um, I ended up doing the same thing. Took bees and brood, moved them to the top, left one frame in the bottom that had some, uh, a few a handful of nurse bees, a little bit of brood, a few drawn frames, some waxed foundation. Uh, that one did not swarm. I ended up losing the queen later that year though. She ended up dying. Uh, seemed kind of odd, but it does occasionally happen. You lose a queen now and then. Uh, that one did not swarm. Uh, they, they ended up rejecting my queen cell I put in the top box. And remember, I was trying to use it as a two-fold purpose, not only preventing swarming, but a, as an opportunity to raise a queen in the top box. They rejected that cell. They tore it down. Uh, the cell was two to three days away from emerging. Probably if I had it, had dropped it in, the day it emerged, it would have worked better. Uh, they rejected that cell, but that's fine. Uh, I ended up taking another queen and putting her back in that bottom box after the, I found the other one had died. Um, it was odd that she died, she didn't swarm. A tremendous amount of bees, um, it happens. That one also produced a good uh, honey crop. Uh, I did it to several boxes, um, mixed results. So there's a couple examples. Now, another box, 
I did a little different. Every seven days, I was going back into the, the brew chamber. Every seven days, I was pulling most of the brood out and putting it into that very top box and dropping empty frames, empty frames back in that bottom one. So every seven days, she only had a handful of eggs and brood because I kept stealing them and putting them in that top box. So one hive, I kept rotating frames. That one never swarmed. Tremendous population because I had because I had all that brood emerging in the top box. And they would filter down through the center boxes and down eventually to the bottom. But most of the nurse bees and all the brood was hanging out in the top because I kept rotating eggs and larva to the top box. So they were barely getting it, barely getting a chance to really do much in the bottom. I kept stealing it, moving it to the top box. The bottom box continually had drawn frames because I was dropping in drawn frames. So that pop, that particular population really blew up. Um, never swarmed. That one produced probably one of my best honey crops. But I had to be in it every seven days, stealing brood and moving it to the top box so they never build up much at the bottom. So it seemed like a lot of extra work. Um, yes, it did work, but the amount of labor of constantly getting in, moving all those boxes, pulling frames out of the bottom box, putting them in the very top box. If you're doing one or two hives, not so bad. If you've got a bunch of hives, way too much work. It, it functions, too much work. So, as an experiment, I had a couple other hives right next to them. I did what I've done in the past. Uh, waited till they were to the point of swarming where they're starting to create queen cells. I go in, I pull the old queen, two to three frames of bees and brood, put them in a new box. You got an option of either cutting all the queen cells out and introducing a young queen, or if they've got a nice, healthy, capped over cell and you liked the original mother queen, cut them all out except for one. Leave one cell. Only one, don't leave a bunch of cells in there. One cell, let it hatch, emerge, go on its mating flights, come back, take over, and just let it go from there. Once they do that, if there's only the one queen, they're not gonna swarm. That works really well. It has a drawback, because you have a time period there where you don't have a queen lane, so you might have a little dip in population. It prevents them from swarming. You move the old queen into a new box, you can either sell that nuke, you can use her for resources to, as she's continuing to lay. You could even pull frames of eggs out and drop them back in the original hive so that you don't have that dip in population. That particular method produces basically as much honey as me manipulating with a Damare. Will I try the Damare again? I probably will. I'll probably do it on a couple boxes next year. But for me, the only way to keep them from swarming still was to continually move brood frames out of that bottom to the very top. And I mean every seven days. If you didn't, they would build up the population quick enough in the spring, they're still gonna swarm. So yeah, I'll try it again, but I probably won't do it with much more than a couple hives next year, just to experiment, see how it works. So to me, too labor intensive. Easier to wait until they build up, pull a split, let them keep going, keep stacking them boxes on. A couple more things I wanted to update on. One was how did my queen rearing go this year? Well, our first round of queens, we had a little bit of a problem with return on the, the queens from mating flights. Uh, it, tended right when it was time for them to go out on mating flights. We ended up with some rainy days, some uh, blow up storms in the afternoon, uh, cold, windy, fluctuations up and down like crazy. So I had kind of a poor return on mating flights on my very first round. After that, queen rearing all year went fantastic. Uh, I probably averaged 80, 80 plus percent return, uh, really good healthy lane patterns. So queen rearing did well. Uh, the spring nectar flow. Spring nectar flow was pretty good. Uh, it wasn't quite as good as I was hoping for. 
in our area right here, uh, I have a tremendous amount of locust trees in the woods up here behind us. Uh, those got touched by the frost, they did not bloom. I had some locusts probably three quarters of a mile or so down the road here, they did bloom. So we did get a little bit of a, a, a locust tree bloom, uh, a little bit of nectar flow off of that, just not as much as I was expecting. Blackberry flow did real well. You don't get a tremendous amount of nectar off of blackberry. You do get some, and you do get a lot of pollen off of it. Overall, the spring flow was really good. I would say that the average production hive still produced at least three supers of honey. Uh, we tend to pull two off uh, to extract, and then we leave one on because going through the dearth, we have at least six weeks where there's really not much coming in, not really enough to hardly maintain them. So they'll burn through that, let's say 30 plus pounds that's in that one I leave on there. Uh, so far this fall, pretty good nectar flow. Uh, haven't been digging into the boxes too much. Tremendous amount of pollen coming in from everything. Um, we still probably have two and a half, if we're lucky, three weeks before frost. So uh, fingers are crossed that this is going to produce a lot of fall nectar, fall honey. Uh, we'll leave some of it with the bees, some of it we will pull off and extract. So uh, nectar flow this year, the, the honey production, I would say is pretty good. It wasn't excellent, but it was pretty good. We had, had a good quality spring and even some summer honey. So yeah, overall that was, that was pretty good. I really appreciate everybody watching these. Um, some of the videos have got quite a few thousands of views. Um, so if you like these, give us a like, give us a thumbs up on these things and uh, share them with your friends. I make my videos to help the newer beekeeper out. The first few years, beekeepers really stumble through trying to learn things. I try to show what works for me, what hasn't worked for me, um, so maybe they don't make some mistakes, you know. But again, you know, uh, it's kind of localized. Uh, what maybe didn't work for me might work for somebody else. I just try to help them out so they don't make the mistakes that are pretty obvious. Um, yeah, hope you really enjoy these. I'll see you next time.